Buenas tardes clase, uh, vamos a hablar un poco acerca del subjuntivo y cómo funciona el subjuntivo. So how the subjunctive works, um, what we're actually doing when we use the subjunctive tense and then what it is uh, in the sentence. So, so far we know that uh, we've studied verbs and they have taught us everything. The verb is the most important part of the sentence. It tells us number one, the action, what's happening. What, that's the most important part. The infinitive tells us what the meaning of the verb is, what the action is. Hablar, to speak, comer, to eat, etc., etc. That's the infinitive part. The second part is when we conjugate the verb, it tells us who does the action. Yo como, tu comes, el come. That tells us who does it. Then we've also learned about tense or when the verb happens. Okay? So, yo comí, tú comiste, él comía, nosotros comíamos. That's telling us when it happened. So, that's tense. The next thing we're going to learn is about subjunctive, which is a uh, mood. And so, that's a, another aspect of this, but it's a mood. And so far, the with verbs we've studied in the present tense, we've, we've actually been studying them in a mood. It's called the present tense indicative, which means that it indicates that Something is happening right now, so it's indicative of the action that's happening. I guess that's the way you can look at it. Well, the subjunctive is a different mood. It is subject to different things that are happening in the sentence. And so what happens is that uh, the verb has to be formed in a different uh, um, formation. So we have, you can look at the other video that I have posted that shows how to form the subjunctive and the command forms. That is very useful. We're not going to get into that now, but we're going to talk about how we use the subjunctive, how you determine when you de do need to use the subjunctive. Um, because there are definite times when you do, and definite times when you don't. So, so far we've looked at sentences that are, are kind of simple. Uh, sentences that uh, um, just have one subject. Yo tengo una esposa. And then we write another sentence that's kind of choppy. Mi esposa cocina bien. Okay? In English, we would say, I have a wife who cooks well, or I, my wife cooks well. So, you know, we can combine into one sentence the two different ideas, right? But here we have this sentence, yo tengo una esposa, mi esposa cocina bien. One way that we can combine these two sentences is by simply eliminating this second subject right here, because it's already talked about right there. So, we use that same verb, tengo una esposa. And we know that it's a esposa cocina bien. I'm going to link these two together with the verb que, or with the conjunction que. And I need a different color marker. That's not going to work either. Que cocina bien. So I'm linking these two sentences, yo tengo una esposa, mi esposa, mi esposa cocina bien, with just this K. And so what I do is I have two partial sentences. This one up here, yo tengo una esposa, is actually a complete sentence. It can stand by itself. But we're going to put it together with this, and it's actually going to be called what's called a clause. So, and this is another clause, que cocina bien, and these two clauses are very different. The first clause, yo tengo una esposa, can stand by itself. I can walk up to you on the street and I say, yo tengo una esposa, yo tengo un coche, yo necesito uh, diez dólares, whatever, and it makes sense, okay? But I can't walk up to you and say, que cocina bien, para ir al cine. Uh, the, the, they, they depend on the first part of the sentence to give meaning to it. So this clause right here will depend on this sentence, uh, this clause, for me. So we call this one that can act on its own the independent clause. It can act on its own. It's its own boss. It tells everything that happens. It can be on its own. It's independent. This one, however, depends on this one for meaning. So it's called a dependent clause. Depends on it. Okay? So I can't use this one all by itself in a sentence, but this one I can. And that's what independent clause 
and dependent clause or subordinate clause or antecedent clause. There's a lot of different names for them. Okay? You can look at them as independent clause and dependent clause. This clause is dependent or subordinate to this clause. It gets its information from this clause. It won't make sense without this one. So, yo tengo una esposa que cocina bien. So, notice there are two subjects. Yo tengo esposa cocina. So, the, the subject of the second clause is esposa. Here she's the direct object. Yo tengo una esposa que cocina bien. So, what we're doing is we're transferring this subject to that clause. So, it's just sort of we're using two subjects, okay, and um, putting in one sentence. Yo tengo una esposa que cocina bien into one sentence. I have a wife who cooks well. In English, we can say who, who cooks or that cooks well. Um, sometimes we can even eliminate the that. But in Spanish, we always have to have the K when we combine these two sentences like this. The K has to be in there. Yo tengo una esposa que cocina bien. I can't say yo tengo una, una esposa que cocina bien. Okay? Can't do that. We use K to link these two together and always has to be there. So this K is very important in this uh, in the formula of subjunctive because basically it's the verb that comes after the K that is going to change. Okay, depending on what it's like. Now, so this dependent clause, we're going to look at it as its own entity, but it's dependent. It depends on this one for meaning. And if it doesn't like the meaning that this clause gives it, then it puts it in a bad mood. It's pretty picky. So we call that mood the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood. So it's a mood. Okay? And so there are several things that this dependent clause does not like. It's pretty simple. The first thing it doesn't like, it does not like weirdos. So, that's an acronym. Okay, weirdo. Will, wish, desire. E. In uh, these are emotions. I, impersonal expressions. That is whenever we use the verb es to begin the sentence. Uh, sentence es bueno, es verdad, es cierto. All of those, um, the subject is it. And so those are called the impersonal expressions, where the subject is it. And we don't have a, a pronoun that expresses, that expresses it in Spanish. You say, well, what about lo? Well, lo only works if it's the direct object, so we can't do it because it's a subject. So what do we use when the subject is it? We, we don't use a pronoun, we don't use a noun, it, we just conjugate the verb. Es bueno, okay? Es uh, um, malo, llueve, nieva, it snows, it's raining, está nevando, está lloviendo. The subject is it, there is no, we can't put lo in the front of there, it just doesn't make sense. Lo can only be used as the direct object, so don't put lo for that subject. So this is impersonal expressions. Those are the ones that it doesn't like. Okay? Um, well, it doesn't like the impersonal expressions that raise some kind of a doubt or certainty. Okay? It doesn't like recommendations. Or requests. It doesn't like doubt or denial. And ojalá. Ojalá is a word that means I wish. Literally, it means would to God. It comes from Arabic, and uh, it's uh, and you don't have to use K with ojalá. That's the one rule that's a little bit. But all of these, if it expresses a will, wish, or desire in this first sentence, in this first clause, and it's followed by K and it links the two together, then what has to be in this is a subjunctive. Same thing with emotions, impersonal expressions, recommendations, requests, doubt, denial, and ojalá. So let's, let's give a few that uh, work this way. So uh, one thing that we like to use is quiero, because why? Because we like it. Quiero que tú. Okay. Now, what I'm doing is, is I want that you, and I want you to do something. Okay? And you're not necessarily going to do it. It doesn't guarantee that this is going to happen. It doesn't guarantee that you are going to do it. Yo quiero que tú 
estudies, and that's an E, not an A. So I have to make that subjunctive. Quiero que tú estudies. I want you to study. That's how I say it in English. Literally, I want that you study. Quiero que tú estudies. So here is our clause, quiero, I want. Again, I can walk up to you in the street and say, quiero. You don't know what I want. It's kind of incomplete, but it's a complete sentence. There's a verb and a subject. This is not complete. Que tú estudies. Que tú me compres. Something. I don't know. Let's look at another one. Necesito. Que me traigas. Comida. I need that you bring me food, literally, or I need you to bring me food. In English we can say, we can drop off that, that, in that case, I need you to bring me, okay? And this is, you're the subject of that bringing. I need that you bring me food. That's what we're literally saying. And so, necesito, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to do it. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to happen, so it puts it in that bad or that subjunctive mood, and so we make the verb change, and we use the subjunctive tense. So that's really what we're doing with all of these sentences. Quiero que tú estudies. Necesito que me traigas comida. So emotions, okay? Um, those are both will, wish, and desire. Uh, emotion. Uh, me alegro. It makes me happy that. Okay. Nosotros ganemos. It makes me happy that we win. Me alegro que nosotros ganemos. I'm happy that we win. And then notice that it's not in the preterite. This is saying when we do win. It's in the present tense. Me alegro que ganemos. It makes me happy when we win. Okay. Me alegro que ganemos. Porque nosotros ganemos. All right. The other emotions that go along with that, um, that are in there, your book will have a ton of them that explains it. Impersonal expressions, this is where we use es. Es ridículo. It is ridiculous. Que tú compres un yate. It's ridiculous that you buy a yacht, that you're buying a yacht. It's ridiculous que tu compres un yate. All right? That's an impersonal expression. It's ridiculous. It is uh, whatever. It's bueno. It's malo. Es uh, duloso. Es um, cierto. Okay? Es cierto. That actually does indicate a certainty, though. So that wouldn't require the subjunctive. But it's one of those impersonal expressions. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Recommendation or request. Recomiendo que. I recommend that. Does it guarantee that you're going to do it? Okay. Recomiendo que. Escriban. La composición. Oy, I recommend that you write your composition today. Doesn't guarantee that you're going to do that, but I recommend it. Okay? Sugiero que escriba la composición hoy. I suggest it. Any kind of uh, suggestion. Any time that there's doubt. Do okay. And again, I'm putting yo as all of these subjects here, but it could be a difference. Let's try a different one. Dudamos que los estudiantes... Um, vayan a fallar el examen. We doubt that the students are going to fail the, the exam. Dudamos que los estudiantes vayan a fallar el examen. Notice, ir, that's our irregular, and it's in a regular subjunctive form. So, vayan a fallar el examen. Um, doubt or denial. And then, ojalá. And ojalá we can use it with or without K. Ojalá lean un buen libro. 
I hope that you read a good book. doesn't guarantee that it's going to happen, but it uh, is a suggestion. So again, if, and again, I can go through here, and I'm going to separate every single one of these into two clauses. Always before the K, just like I did here. Dudamos, oh, there's a, supposed to be a K there. Dudamos que los estudiantes, whoops, dividing line has to be before the K, 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 K. All of those, there's two clauses. All of these clauses cannot stand by themselves. They're independent. They depend on that first part. And if it puts it in any kind of doubt, if it is any kind of a suggestion, if it's any kind of emotion, any kind of a um, will, wish, or desire, any one of these, if it's a weirdo, um, it doesn't like it, and so it puts it in a bad or a subjunctive mood. Okay, and these are the ones that we're primarily going to be working with this semester is, is will, wish, desire, emotions, in-person expressions, recommendations, requests, that and I, aloha, that we'll get a lot of practice. Chapter 12, 13, and 14 are all about the subjunctive. Okay, and then we'll repeat it again in, in, uh, in Spanish 4. So if you take Spanish 4, you'll get a good healthy dose of it there as well. So all of those trigger, and we can look at it this way, they trigger the subjunctive. What comes before the K, and this is what the important part is. Look at the K. Okay, it's the verb that comes right before the K. The K is key. Okay? And there's not with ojalá, but it's what comes before it. If what comes before it puts any kind of uncertainty into the situation, then the subjunctive has to follow. Okay? So that's the first thing it doesn't like, weirdos. The next thing it doesn't like is a space. And a space is just um, another uh, mnemonic device, uh, an acronym for a set of uh, conjunctions of contingency and purpose that all require the subjunctive. Notice they're almost all going to have a K, and they're all going to um, indicate that uh, an uncertainty. So a menos K is the first one, unless that. Okay? Voy a la biblioteca. A menos que separate that, it's not one whole word. A menos que me Llame Bob. Okay? Voy a la biblioteca a menos que me llame Bob. So if Bob calls, then I'm not going to the library. But I am going to the library unless he calls. So this a menos que always triggers the subjunctive. Sin que. Para que. And this one is one that we'll probably use the most. Para que. Okay? Para que. Yo trabajo para que mis hijos coman. I work so that my children eat. Okay? Doesn't guarantee that they're going to eat. Yo trabajo para que. If para que is in the sentence, subjunctive has to be there. Okay? Para que, a fin de que, con tal de que en. I should know better than to do that by now. En caso de que. All of these have a que. And they all indicate some kind of insurgence, uh, 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 an uncertainty, unless, without, in order that, with, to the end that, such that, in case that. And basically whatever comes after them has to be subjunctive. So that's the second thing it doesn't like. It doesn't like a weirdos. Weirdo, a space, or... Flakes. 
And this is what I mean by flakes. So I'm going to erase this. Flakes are things that don't exist or haven't happened yet. So let's look at this sentence that I originally had. Yo tengo una esposa que cocina bien. I have a wife that cooks well. You can see it's evident, right? But if I change tengo to busco, Okay, now, yo tengo here, she's there, she exists. In the sentence, grammatically, she exists. Tango indicates that she is there, I have it. Busco, that means I'm looking for her, she's not there. Okay, yo busco una esposa, que, and now because she doesn't there, she's not exists, we're, it's uncertain, there's an uncertainty there. We have to use a subjunctive, que, cocine, Bien. So whatever comes before the K, again, this is the real takeaway. If whatever comes before the K expresses any kind of uncertainty, this clause is picky and it puts it in that bad or that subjunctive mood. Tangle. It likes tangle because it's there. She exists. He can see her. Okay? If it happens in the future. Yo voy a tener un coche que... Funcione bien. Okay? This is a little bit different. I'm still using tener, but look, voy a tener. I don't have it yet. It doesn't exist. Yo voy a tener un coche que funcione bien. It's going to happen, maybe. Doesn't guarantee it. Okay? Comes before. What after comes after the K has to be in the subjunctive. And it's this verb that comes right after that. And that's the one that changes the subject. The subject of cocina is esposa. And the subject of funcione is coche. And it's, so that's how we split it up. We're just taking, so in your book, it's going to explain about two different subjects, how you can tell which one. It's the one that comes after K is the second subject, and it was the direct object here. Okay? And so we're just combining those two sentences, those two choppy sentences, rather than saying, yo tengo una esposa, mi esposa co cocina bien, or yo busco una esposa, una esposa que cocina bien. Okay, yo voy a tener un coche. What, uh, um, un coche que funciona bien. I just combine them into one and I put the K in there and it puts it in a bad or subjunctive mood if it expresses that uh, kind of a, a doubt or uncertainty. So those are the three things it doesn't like. Weirdo, a space, and flakes. And if it expresses one of those, really, don't worry, we're not going to get too much into the flakes thing this semester, but more we're worried about weirdo and a space. Uh, and I think even a space isn't too much. It's really weirdo that we're going into now. Okay. Will, wish, desire, emotions, impersonal expressions, reacción, recomendación, dudos, uh, or dudas, and ojalá. So that's how the subjunctive works. And um, we cannot change the word order around. In English we can say uh, we may be able to change this a little bit around. But guess what? We can't in Spanish. Yo tengo una esposa que cocina bien. It doesn't change. It does not change. Okay. So those are the ones it does. Now, when I first started learning um, these, I learned, uh, well, I started memorizing. I started memorizing all the different verbs that triggered the subjunctive. And I knew there was querer plus que. And esperar. Es I, I want, I hope, necesito, necesitar, we'll necesitar, all of those plus K, there's a whole bunch of them. And I started writing it down on a sheet of notebook paper, and my paper got huge, and it was big, and I'm like, I can't memorize this, this is too much. So I said, well, you know what, we don't, when we do this kind of sentence, we don't use the indicative all that much. Maybe it's easier for me to memorize the ones that um, just indicate the indicative, that don't require the subjunctive. And so that's what I started memorizing. And guess what? It was a much smaller list. And so if it expresses a certainty before that, okay, here's one. Es cierto que. Es cierto que.
Compramos taco. It is certain. That's going to happen. It says it right there. It's certain. Es seguro. Es verdad. Okay? Impersonal expressions. Um, creo. Okay, now, with creo, we're saying that the belief exists. I believe that. Creo que tienen computadores en esa tienda. I believe they have computers in that store. Now, in English, we'll uh, inflect doubt into this sentence by our inflection. I believe that they have computers there. I'm not really sure. But in Spanish, it's the opposite. And I still may inflect it in there, but I guess what? I still use the indicative because creo indicates a certainty. I believe that. Okay? And same thing with pienso. Pensar. Pienso que. Piensas que. Both of those... They require the indicative. Or just the regular present tense. If I, if I take that out, I put a no, now I've taken the certainty out of it. No creo que, no pienso que. And that requires the subjunctive, okay? Creo que, pienso que, always indicative. No creo que, no pienso que, always subjunctive. Okay? So that's how um, these work. Now I can get around using this by using some uh, uh, infinitives uh, or I can use uh, some conjunctions like para. Okay? Um, uh, well, let me give an example of that. Estudio Español, okay, I study Spanish so that I can live in Latin America, all right, I can use para que, and then use poder, I have to change the subject, Estudio Español para que pueda, okay, but if I just use para, The good thing about para is because um, it is uh, a preposition. Whatever comes after prepositions, and it's usually para and de, whatever is going to come after those is going to be the infinitive. 